A very warm welcome to all our viewers and listeners to our new quarter, the final in this year. Can't believe it's gone so quickly, Daryl. And of course, our lesson or our study for this quarter is going to be on the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, mm -hmm. What a beautiful Bible study. Uh, but before we get into our study, uh, Daryl, would you be happy to open the word of prayer and just welcome our viewers to? Of course, of course. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, we are excited about a new study together. And before we dive in, though, let's uh, invite the Holy Spirit to guide our thinking and our conversation and our study. Let's pray. Father God, what a privilege it is to, to be able to open your word um, at our leisure, in the comfort of our homes, our offices, um, wherever we are. We, we don't take this privilege lightly and we are very grateful for it. Thank you, Lord. And now as we embark on studying the book of Deuteronomy together and in particular the introduction today we are asking that your spirit will be with each viewer with each listener mm -hmm. and also with brian and myself as we share insights together lord guide our thinking um place the, the words in our mouths that you would have us share mm -hmm. and may each heart on the receiving end be blessed mm -hmm. um stir our minds and uh yeah bring Bring new light where it's needed, comfort where it's needed, reassurance where it's needed. Amen. And through, through the study, may your name be glorified. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have our <clears throat> Bible study or lesson one, the preamble or introduction the book of Deuteronomy. Of course, the word Deuteronomy uh, in the Hebrew just means the words. Of course, these are the words of the Lord through his servant Moses. But in um, the Greek, it has a dual application. Uh, we get the word duet, meaning two people singing. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a repetition of the law, Deuteronomy. Uh, and uh, here we find Moses has led the children of Israel for 40 years through the wilderness and they are about to embark on the entrance of Canaan, the new uh, place that God had promised for them. And um, Moses knows that this is his farewell speech and gives a lot of history um, about God's grace, God's deliverance, God's goodness. And uh, our memory text says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Uh, 1 mm -hmm. John 4 verse 8. Yeah. And, and Moses is um, going over the history of Israel to show the children of Israel the grace and mercy and love of God. How he has redeemed them from slavery, mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. Egypt. And uh, although it was not God's will for them to be in the wilderness for 40 years, that was their rebellion um, and their choice. And yet 40 years has come and gone. And there's a new generation that is about to embark on the entrance into the promised land, except for Moses, um, Joshua and Caleb, uh, all those who were 20 years and older had died in the wilderness. Miriam has died. Uh, Aaron has died. And Moses is about to go and rest on the top of Mount Nebo, on Pisgah. And um, we find that he covers the history uh, in this section here and reminds the children of Israel of God's promises, God's power, mm. God's presence. And um, it was interesting, Daryl, as we looked at um, how um, Moses brings about the, 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 the quintessential theme of the Bible, which is God is love. Throughout this, we yeah. see Moses is bringing the people to realize that, in essence, the character 
of God, which is love. He is the one that has brought them to you. So as we look at love to be loved, are there any themes that came through to you in the introduction, Daryl? What, what, what um, thoughts came through to you as the servant of the Lord Moses rehearsed the history of the children of Israel? It wasn't a pleasant history. Uh, it was yeah. one of rebellion, yeah. one of uh, a stiff-necked people. And um, we know, of course, from the Sinai um, Covenant uh, Mount, they took almost 39 years in the wilderness. Uh, one year almost they took at Mount Sinai. And, um, of course, we know what happened there. But here God is revealing himself again um, in the words, the farewell words of Moses. How did that come through to you, Daryl, as you pondered over this experience that Moses relates to God's people? Sure. Um, so many um, thoughts, Brian, but, but perhaps just two before we get into some of the detail of the lesson. Mm. Um, in, in researching a little bit and reading up, I, one commentator um, described this as, as mm. Moses' valedictory speech. Mm. And, um, and that took me back to, to the many years that I've been involved with schools over, over my own career, my own time at school, my son's time at school, and, and even since then. And that valedictory moment is quite significant where um, it's usually a, a, a matric student who has had an extraordinary experience of high school and it's, it's usually someone who looks back with a, a sense of wonder of what their experience has been like and this for me was a, a, a beautiful way of describing what, um, um, what Moses' culmination message was going to be for his people because he was looking back on on not just a high school or university short period of time, but in a way an entire career and an entire lifetime um, that he had traveled with this group of people. And usually in, a, in a, uh, that kind of, of moment, there are anecdotes and experiences that come into a valedictory speech Mm. that people that in the audience can all relate to because they were somehow connected to that experience. And I thought it was a fitting way of describing what Moses is, is about to do to give the most extraordinary valedictory speech ever recorded. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so he starts with, with exactly what most valedictorians do is going back. And he starts recounting a journey and, I mean, that journey was right through the book of Exodus, um, through Numbers, through Leviticus. There's these extraordinary descriptions. And he tries to encapsulate 40 years mm. of millions of people into a, a highlights reel. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this theme, love to be loved, would be the title for that reel of highlights. Right. That if you were to look back on those 40 years and say, what was the essence of it? Mm. What would be the single phrase of it? And as Moses recounts their experience over the many years, it's almost as though that's his caption. Mm. And his instruction to the children of Israel now is love because you have been loved. You have been loved extraordinarily because everybody except Jaleb, um, Joshua and Caleb in, in his, listening to his address was born in the desert. Right. This is all they know. And so the, he is recapping their entire life's experience. And mm. I would give it the title as the author is here, is a command to, to love because they have been loved. They have experienced the love of God over these 40 years in extraordinary ways. And, and I'm sure that as we unpack um, the various parts of these speeches over the next few weeks, we will have glimpses and evidences of that. 
But right. that for me was just a beautiful summary phrasing is you have been loved for the last 40 years. Mm. Now it's your <laughs> turn to love in return. So it's incredible, uh, Daryl, that uh, Moses, who is the writer, of course, of the first five books of the Bible um, and also the book of Job, it is believed. Um, the, the first 11 chapters of Genesis is really a, a history of the beginning of creation and the fall of man into disobedience. And the first 11 chapters actually take us up to about 2,000 years of history. Um, uh, and past the, the flood uh, to the time of Abram. Uh, and when we consider uh, the, the love of God to redeem man, it starts right there in the Garden of Eden immediately after the fall. Uh, the promise is that the Messiah would come. And when we think of that love that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have for lost humanity, we are awed that God would pursue man and um, seek to have a relationship that man might dwell with him. So, Dale, as we look at the theme then um, of this um, wonderful study for Sunday, love to be loved. Um, here, the children of Israel are about 2 million because the book of Numbers, uh, the men were numbered about 600,000 that were able yeah. to go to war. Um, so when you add the women and children, and yeah. um, there's a mixed multitude that's still uh, there as well, and many of them have been born in the desert, as you said, um, they're about still 2 million as they get to the shore or the other side of Jordan, uh, as they yeah. get to the shore to cross over. And, and here, uh, Moses reminds him of the love of God. Now, for, for many there uh, that didn't understand the redemption that God brought to them. Um, Moses reminding to teach them their children. But uh, as we look at this uh, idea of love, what is uh, most important or paramount about the fact that love to be love is essentially the freedom to choose. We see that in the, in the Garden of Eden, right? So um, out of all the trees in the midst of the garden, God said to them, you know, you may freely eat. And there were maybe a thousand different trees. Who knows? You know, there's just that one restriction. Um, and it is a test. And um, the choice was theirs to exercise. Sadly, we know they made a wrong choice. They listened to the serpent. And as we look at um, the love of God to give man the freedom to choose, I mean, love to be love must be a freedom of choice. Um, no one put a gun to your head, Dale, and said, you will marry Gary. <laughs> that was the relationship that you and Gary yeah. developed and was the choice you made. So when you stood before yeah. the altar and said, I do uh, take this man to my lawful wedded husband, um, it was the power of choice. And um, that's what's exciting about this thing, love. But there is a risk yeah. with love. And we see, Daryl, yeah. um, the choice that um, this uh, most high and honored angel, uh, Lucifer, is entitled the light bearer, <clears throat> made in heaven. We see, sadly, in Isaiah 14, verse 12 to 14, Ezekiel 28, verse 12 to 17. I don't think we'll have time to read all the text, but if you'd like to read any, Daryl, that's fine. I'll be happy to highlight them for our viewers. But we yeah. see there's a fall from heaven. Uh, this yeah. angel who was honored of God, who was next to God, um, he was not satisfied with the position he had, even though he could sing four-part harmony, even though his covering was all the brilliant and dazzling colors of gold and emerald and rubies. And here yeah, he desires to be like the Most High. Isn't that a sad and tragic choice that we see Right from the courts of heaven down to planet earth, there is the sad um, summary in Revelation 12, verses 7, and there was war in heaven. Uh, Michael, Jesus, and his angels fought, yeah. and the dragon, the old serpent called the devil, he fought, and they were cast out. And we find when Adam and Eve made the choice to disobey God, they fell, and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. 
Um, how is it then that God would take such a huge risk, Daryl, that he would create yeah. his creatures in heaven and on earth and give him this thing called the power to choose? So, Brian, I think, it's, I think it shows us a, a very deep insight into the heart of God. Mm. Um, you know, he could have he could have created all his beings um, without that choice. He could have enjoyed their adoration for eternity. Um, he could have wired them in such a way that they would always sing his praises. Mm. You know, he could have he could have created Adam and Eve like that. He could have ensured that you know he, he he could have designed us created us and placed us on this earth in such a way that we could never step out of his will that we could never um choose to defy that we mm -hmm. could never go against um he could have done that and i think it it just reveals to us the who he is and how he embodies what love really is because he would have had adoration he would have had worship he right. would have had harmony he would have had joy and laughter and all of that but he would not have had love hmm. because love implies that i have chosen you right and and we would have lived possibly in a world without a lot of the pain and suffering that there is now but we also would have lived in a world without love mm. because without that choice um we would not have experienced what it means to choose for god right. we would have not experienced real freedom um in him and he had to allow for the possibility of not loving him mm. for that love to be genuine you know and we can you know we read a uh, you you mentioned the two passages the one in isaiah and the one in ezekiel that give this extraordinary description of lucifer before the fall and you know we look at that we read that and we go why would you choose anything else mm. um wh why would you why would you go against that you were perfect you were magnificent you had everything and then you you realize for a moment but we've we've done exactly the same right. god, god has given us that choice he's made us um beautifully perfectly in in so many ways and and he's given us exactly the same choice um and for me it, it really just does indicate the the depth um and the purity of the love that is in the heart of god mm. and and the and how magnetic that is for me it's part of what draws me in you know he could have reeled us in like a little robot but he chose not to he he chose to give us that that opportunity and so therefore the the connection that we have with him as a result of that um is one that we have chosen and it mm. brings with it then the joy that comes with the relationship that we've chosen thank you daryl so as we look at god who is love not just loving uh not that he just loves us but that yeah. he is love he yeah. is the essence he is the greatest uh proponent of what love is because he himself is love and so it gives a glimpse into how god uh governs heaven and the universe and when we look at lucifer's fall he said i would i want to be like the most high i want to sit in the side of the north i want to be lifted up so his heart uh had chosen to rebel against god because he was dissatisfied with the position he had even though he was a favorite of all angels so as we look at um the war in heaven sadly we find it transitions to war uh on the earth as we look at monday 
Um, and we see in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, um, when uh, we come to the place where God uh, speaks to Adam. Uh, and, and, and I found this uh, interesting, Daryl, because uh, Genesis 2, 16 and 17 is uh, God speaking to Adam before Eve was actually created from the side of Adam. And he's yeah. addressing Adam and he's saying to yeah. him, you can eat of every tree of the garden. Um, and let's say there was a thousand, you know, uh, trees there in the garden of Eden and only one. So he had 999 to eat from. So there's this incredible freedom of choice to enjoy God's creation. And God says, okay, just this one, um, you will not eat of it because in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Um, and it was called, interestingly, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So as, as we look at um, the devil's temptation now in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 7, um, he's addressing Eve. Now that the devil starts with the woman here, somehow they've been separated from each other. And that's a, a lesson for all married couples that we should never be separated from each other. You know, I, I find it strange, Dell, and even in ministry, some, some couples are separated by long distances, long periods of time. And um, I find it's always dangerous because, you know, um, they say um, absence makes the heart grow fonder, but um, it also, absence makes the eyes wander. Eh? And um, <laughs> yeah, Eve has wandered away and her eyes are following the suggestion of the serpent and she looks at the fruit and she desires it because... Um, Satan has told her, if you eat of this tree, uh, you will be like God. So we see uh, the same desire he had to be like God in heaven. Uh, he gives to the woman as a temptation that, listen, God is unfair. God is restrictive. Uh, why has he withheld this tree? Because this tree will make you wise and um, you will know both good and evil. And I believe, Dale, it was just more than, uh, and to our viewers, more than just them knowing and experience what is good and evil, but it was, you will decide what is best for you. You will decide what you feel is good and what you feel is bad. Uh, don't trust God because God has withheld this from you. And, and we see that in the world today. The world says, if you, if you go my way, if you buy this car, if you live in this area, if you dress like this, you know, you will be like um, the best. You will be making this statement here. And uh, we also see that in the way how um, people are even taught in schools. Uh, there's this, you know, people are divided along racial lines, sadly. Um, we are better than you. I mean, that whole war in the Nazis that was fought was, we are superior than you and the Jews are to be exterminated. So we find this idea that man wants to make their own choices. Uh, you will decide what is best for you. So as we look at this here, uh, Daryl, how is it then that in a perfect environment in heaven, man fell, in a perfect environment in the Garden of Eden, man fell? Did God create man um, with this flaw? Or was there this wonderful thing called choice, which determines whether we are obedient and true and loving to God, that would show God is really who he is, a God of love. So I think building on one of your earlier comments, Brian, and, and I wanted to call out particularly, you mentioned Genesis 3, verse 1 to 7, where mm. Eve encounters the serpents in the, in the garden. And I think there's, um, there's a, a critical statement that or phrasing that we often overlook, and it's in verse 5 of that chapter, mm -hmm. where the serpent says to the woman, For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And then this is the bit. Um, you will be like God, mm. knowing good and evil. And actually, 
You know, if I think for a moment, Eve was not wandering around the garden wanting to be like God. Mm -hmm. Not that she was wondering how can she be like God. Mm. This is what mattered to the serpent. This is what mattered to this is what Lucifer wanted in heaven was to be like God. Mm. And this was what how he felt. Right. Was he wanted to be like God. And he now takes the essence of his fall mm. and places that on her and opens a thought for her that she had not even conceived of then. Because I don't think for a moment that as I said that she was wandering around trying to find a way to be like God. Mm. But he's planted the seed of the thought that led to his fall mm. now with her. And I believe it is the seed of any fall, of anyone who chooses, um, who exercises that freedom of choice that God has given them against God, mm. is one who has fallen into that lie is that you can be like God. And I think your description just now is how the world subtly has taken that same lie and said, if you make these choices for yourself, you are the God of your life. Mm. Don't let anybody else say what you can and can't do. Right. Don't let anybody else put the restrictions in for you. Um, because that is the essence of that first fall in heaven. It is the essence of the fall in the garden. And it is the essence of any fall in our lives mm. is around us exercising the freedom that God gave us, but in a way that tries to make us like him. Mm. Because we believe that our, our choice is better than his choice. And so therefore we are placing ourselves as the God of our lives. When we choose to do something that he's warned us, if you go, if you eat this fruit, you will die. Mm. So it's not a threat. It's, it's informing us that eating of this fruit leads to death. Now you right. have a choice. Um, I'm not saying I will kill you if you eat it. I'm saying that the eating of this results in death. You have the choice. And so we have absorbed Lucifer's lie when we go, no, I don't think I'm going to die. I think I'm going to choose to eat this fruit hmm. in whatever that form might then take in our lives. And so we see the progression then from Eden all the way through to the flood right. of person by person by person by person over these generations, these thousands of years that have brought us to the flood, that God now looks on a world where everyone has chosen mm. to be the God of their own lives right. and has chosen to do things that result in death. And we then read at the time of Noah that God looks at all of this and he's He's saddened by where this perfect mankind has ended up mm -hmm. um, by the time of the flood. And, and yet the same God that we then described earlier as being love says, well, let's give them another chance. And then we go into the story of, of mm -hmm. Noah from there. But that for me was just such a powerful lesson um, from Lucifer's fall and then the fall in, in Eden and how that relates to our lives. Yes, thank you, Daryl. And this is something that the devil still weaves through the themes of these chosen ones, because here is uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God says, I'll put enmity between you, the devil, the serpent, and your seed, and between the woman, the church, and her seed. And of course, there's the promise of the Messiah that would bruise the head of the serpent. Uh, but today, uh, the devil has his own religion. And um, it's quite um, sobering to think that before, you know, spiritualism and satanic worship was something that was done in a corner and hidden. 
but it's now it's like in your face it's on your tv it's on your 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 cell phone or smart screens it's uh, on your tablets it's on billboards it's in the shopping malls wherever you go uh, you can be what you want to be and uh, one of the mottos of the new age movement uh, in fact coming through from Alistair Crowley um, and Andrew Levair the high priest of satanic worship their motto is do what the world is the whole of the law whatever you choose whatever you decide is good or bad um, you are god you have god inside of you and the new age movement is full of that theme that god is in you you can be what you want to be um, and so as we look at the fall daryl uh, in genesis chapter 3 1 to 7 Uh, we come now to the call of Abram. That's two thousand one hundred years fast forward. The flood has taken place, and um, someone emerges after the flood. The, the the man by the name of Nimrod, and his name actually means he shall rebel. Uh, he starts a city. The Tower of Babel is one of the monumental projects that they build because they want to make a name for themselves. They yeah. don't want to. worship this created god who's given a covenant the rainbow that he will never destroy this earth and we find in the building of the tower of babel um it's a uh, one world religion uh they want to worship god and ellen white says they built the idols uh the places of worship in the tower and um it was god who destroyed and stopped that project of rebellion by confounding them and we find the devil There's a call to Abram um, out of Ur of Chaldea. Now that's about 300 kilometers southeast of Baghdad, where the town Babel was. Babylon, the ancient city, is still there. And um, as I drove with Pastor Franz and our group from Babylon to Ur of the Chaldees, uh, one of the most imposing structures that is still present there in Ur of the Chaldees is this ziggurat, this high monument that was. built to the honor of the moon god uh, so they worship the moon god they in Ur of the chaldees and the sun god in babylon but the two gods were together one was the female aspect the moon goddess and one was the male ex- aspect the sun um but here daryl god calls abram out of this place of sun worship moon worship um the occult uh, Ur of the chaldees and god tells him listen Abram if you will obey me if you will leave your kindred uh, and go to a place that I will call you to go I'm going to bless you and make you a great nation so we see here is the gospel given here to Abram if you will be obedient to me uh, I will bless you uh, what do you think uh, is the underlying theme mm. the call of Abram and to us as god's people and his call because it's a similar call to come out of babylon mystical babylon in revelation 18 come out of her my people and we find here that um, the call of abram is something god wants us to understand is his call to us how does that uh, come through to you in uh, the life and the death and resurrection of jesus because we find paul gives an analogy um of Jesus um being the a the one who is the promise given to God's people to become heirs um how does that come through and as we look at the story of Stephen's uh uh martyr we see again there's a repetition of the history of Moses and the rebellion of Israel and the promise of god to bless his people how do we put this all together there how does it come through to you i think it summarized brian um as probably a call to remember mm. um that that that's how i see this this whole part of the lesson um you know i i think one of the things that stands out so strongly is is that god is not limited or constrained by our inability to remain faithful mm. you know the fact that we we just can't we we see it 
you know, through the lineage, you just read the lineage of Jesus from Abraham down to 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 the time of Joseph, and mm. and you just read generation after generation that has failed God, and um, and yet um, God is is to to follow the prescription that that He gives us, and for me, what stood out in um, in reading again the words of Stephen when when he was being stoned. Um, was again that call to remember that over the generations there is at no point in the history of Israel all the way from that promise to Abraham right through to the time of it being fulfilled in Christ is mm. there was never a time that they were forgotten. There was right. never a time that they were abandoned. Mm. And in recalling that story, and I think Mo that's one of the reasons that Moses tells the story, mm. is to recall to the children of Israel that never once in these 40 years were you ever abandoned. Right. You were never here alone. And I think that's what Stephen is now doing generations later is he saying again to a Jewish audience, he's speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees who are stoning him to the people in Jerusalem that are, are, are stoning him is just saying this God loves you. He is the same God that has been with you from the time of Abraham all the way through the generations. And for me, it was a, a call to remembrance, to remember what God has done. And in fact, a little bit later on in, in the study, it, it brought to mind for me those, those well-known words from the Spirit of Prophecy that we have nothing to fear for our future except we forget mm. the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. And that for me was the essence of this mm. book of Deuteronomy is you're about to go into the promised land, but don't forget the same mm. God that has carried you through. And I think, you know, reca recalling that story of Abraham and his call and then Moses recalling that and then Stephen recalling Moses' recollection of that. For me, it's all a call to remembrance Amen. of what God has done for you. And therefore, there's assurance of what lies ahead. Thank you, Daryl. And uh, Paul puts it nicely and succinctly in, in uh, Galatians chapter 3, that if you are Christ, if we have that born again experience, then you are the children of Abraham okay. and is of the same promise that was given to Abraham. And so through Christ, we find uh, the theme runs through in the Old Testament, the Messiah is to come. Well, we're living in the time when Messiah has come um, and has paid the price on the cross. And he is coming again the second time. And as Adventists, we are to give the three angels message of the gospel uh, as it was given to them in type in the wilderness. For us, it's in reality. In Christ, the seed of the woman has come. He has died for us. So, Daryl, uh, we've got like about eight minutes left uh, or so um, as we review the covenant at Sinai. Uh, the yeah. covenant given in Eden was the seed of the woman will come. Uh, Messiah will yeah. come and bruise the head of the serpent. As we get to Mount Sinai, the children of Israel have traveled three months from their deliverance from Egypt. And here they are at the mountain. Um, we don't have time to read Exodus 19, verse 4 to 8. But we see here uh, there is a covenant that God makes with the children of Israel even before the Ten Commandments are written or spoken in Exodus chapter 20, the next chapter. And we find, Daryl, there's a summary in what Moses is told by God to tell the children of Israel. Listen. I have borne you on eagle's wings. I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. So there's the redemption. God has redeemed them out of Egypt. He's brought them here to Sinai. And now he's going to give them the written law. But before the written law is given, um, he says, listen, if you will be obedient and keep my covenant and obey me, uh, I will bless you. The same covenant he made with Abram uh, 400 years plus before. And um, you will be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So here's God's ideal always has been that for his people, that we will be channels, instruments to reach those who don't know this Yahweh, this God of love, this God of grace. 
And, and it's interesting, Daryl, the children of Israel answered Moses, all that the Lord has said, we will do. And in Exodus yeah. chapter 34, twice they mentioned yeah. it, after yeah. the written law, again, all this, the Lord has said, we will do. And we see God gives um, amongst, uh, of course, the covenant, which is the heart, the Ten Commandments, um, there's still also the health laws. There's still the relational laws. There's still also the laws of how we are to treat people. Um, and uh, here is this covenant God makes with them. How is it that they would fail so soon uh, when they've made this promise? What should have been the response? Because clearly, you know, uh, they failed. Uh, we are not promise keepers. Uh, we, we break yeah, our yeah. promises of God. We break our promises to our spouses, to our children, to our bosses. Yeah. This uh, yeah. theme of um, rebellion and disappointment runs through the thread and fabric of man's existence. But God, yeah. God's covenant is based on better promises, we are told in the book of Hebrews. How does this come through to you, Daryl? And what lessons can we learn from the covenant at Sinai? Because they clearly broke that, and that's why they wandered in the wilderness for an extra 39 years. And so when we get the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is reminding him, listen, it's not on your promise, but on God's promise and your willingness to cooperate with God. I think in that, that passage that you mentioned, Exodus 19, Brian brought out two two words that for me were, they weren't used as such, but they, that little passage I think can be summarized in two words. Firstly mm -hmm. is that the essence of covenant is relationship. Um, and it is that God has called his people into relationship. Right. He's called them to be connected with him. That's mm -hmm. what he's called them for. And then there's a commission that comes with that because not only do I want you to be mine, I want you to be my priests. Mm -hmm. So I'm now going to give you something to do. And that for me is what has stayed over the, over the years, over the multiple generations. He calls into relationship and then he commissions. Mm -hmm. He did it with Abraham. He now does it with the children of Israel at Sinai. He calls them into a covenant relationship. And then he commissions them to be his priests. Right. We now are going into the promised land and Moses is reminding them of this covenant relationship. Mm -hmm. And then the commission that they are going to go across into Jordan and they're going to settle a new land as, as his ambassadors. And that for me was the, the essence of, of, of this call, this reminder that the reason God has called them out of Egypt is to reestablish that relationship with them right. and then to commission them to show the world what that relationship looks like. That's beautiful, Daryl. So as we look at the covenant, then uh, it begins with, I brought you out of Egypt. I've been born you on eagle's wings. That was the redemption part of it. God had saved them. As we look at the relationship that you spoke of, God wanted to dwell with them. And that's why the sanctuary service was given there. And the Sabbath, the heart of that covenant Ten Commandment uh, relationship God wanted uh, out of everything to be with his people. And then the God's promise, God's promise was that he would redeem them. He would save them. And we are living in that time. And then, of course, obedience. The fourth part of it is that God wants us to obey. And as they entered into uh, Canaan, there's the two mountains, the Mount Ebal, the Mount of Obedience and Blessings, and Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Disobedience and Curses. And so we find that they failed. And so they, God had to punish them. But uh, as they get to this place now, God wants them to realize that if you'll go forward in my strength, in my power, and trust in my promise to deliver you, that it will be well with you. And so we are living in that time when God wants us to prepare for his soon return, the heavenly Canaan and to prepare others. And so, Daryl, this has been a blessing to um, study with you, uh, as always. And for our viewers, our time has gone so quickly. And um, we just pray that you will study out this theme for yourselves, that we will learn to trust in our God, because with relationship comes this thing called trust. 
Will I trust in God? And it comes from God's word. That's what the word Deuteronomy is, God's words in Hebrew. So let us close in a word of prayer and ask for God's blessing. Father in heaven, we thank you that these are your words. Deuteronomy, the repetition of your law, your law of love, your law of relationship. You have redeemed us and you want us, O oh Lord, to respond in a relationship that is based on trust, obeying you because you know what is best for us. Thank you for the blessing of being able to study together today. Bless each listener, each viewer, each family, that we will be all that you want us to be by your grace. In your precious name we pray. Amen.